I just want to welcome everybody tonight to our webinar with Tim Blank. Before I start, last month we had Dr. Dixon Despamier of Columbia University share some concepts with us that I think are worth reviewing before I hand it over to Tim Blank. And he talked about some of the most, uh, some of those concepts are actually in his book, um, Vertical Farm. And I'm going to see if I can get my slides here to work. Talking about just how we have started to dominate Earth's ecosystems. And yesterday's vision was that we envisioned a dome city to protect us from nature. But the reality of today is that we're the endangered species is really the plant kingdom today. The challenges today are safe and abundant water supply, food safety and security, engaging society in environmental sustainability, and reducing the dependence on fossil fuels. 12,000 years ago, there were no farms on this planet. Now, 12,000 years ago, the population was much smaller than it is today. Today, we're at 7 billion people. And the major problem is, how do we feed those people? Our agricultural footprint to feed 7 billion people takes up the land mass of South America. If you think about the population growth, we're going to reach 10 billion very soon in, by 2050. So that's going to take another huge land mass the size of, I believe it's Brazil we're looking at here. So what are we going to do about all this? And I think that if you read his book, you see that his answer, Dr. Dixon Despamia's answer, is vertical farming. So I'm, I have the pleasure today to introduce to you Tim Blank, who was raised in a rural farm community in the Western Dakotas. Combining a passion for agriculture and science, he graduated in 1992 from Valencia College with a degree in horticulture and greenhouse management. Let me just um, figure out how to change the pre presentation back to you, Tim. And Tim spent over six years at Epcot Center, Epcot Center's Living with the Land Pavilion, conducting research in every horticultural discipline imaginable. He served as the research liaison for the Department of Energy and NASA partnerships with Walt Disney World. He was the chief horticulturist and greenhouse manager at the land until 2005, when he left Disney to launch a one-of-a-kind company called Future Growing. What was Tim's dream? To bring the promise of vertical farming to a commercial reality. He developed a proprietary aeroponic vertical gardening creation, the Tower Garden. His partnership with Jay Martin and Juice Plus is a dream come true. The possibility of individuals being able to own their own vertical garden. Dr. Dispamier was also discussing how the agricultural runoff of today's methods of farming are creating dead zones in our oceans. So today, Tim's going to talk to you about something you and I can personally get involved in, in taking control back of how we access our food and how we can change our planet for the better in terms of living a more sustainable life. It's, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Tim. We've become very good friends with Tim, his wife Jessica, and love his daughter Ava. And Tim, thank you so much for being with us this evening to share your incredible creation. You're welcome, Nisha. Don't forget to unmute uh, yourself, Tim. <laughs> OK, can you hear me OK? You're good. Thanks. OK. Thank you for so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, well, we'll get started. Well, as uh, Nisha just mentioned, uh, my history goes back to the uh, early years at Disney, where I got my training in this very unique science. and. If I pause for a moment and go back to the uh, time in North Dakota that Mitra mentioned, uh, I, I grew up as early as I can remember. I was always a futurist. Um, I was always a humanitarian. I grew up in an environment where the only way to survive was to help care for the people around you and partner and work together. 
And uh, growing up in a rural farm community, um, I, I had uh, um, the unfortunate opportunity to watch the, the uh, small American family farm wither and die one by one, watch the farm get bigger and bigger, and uh, watch all the challenges of agriculture. A farmer could work a whole season and then lose a crop. Uh, grasshoppers or locusts could come in the fall and eat up the crop. And it seemed like the harder the farmer worked, the more devastating the damage could be. It didn't, didn't seem like uh, very fair treatment for a group of human beings that worked so hard to feed the rest of humanity. So um, I always thought as a young lad, uh, there's got to be a better way. And I remember even the early days of my organic garden uh, where I had an opportunity to use a rotor tiller and tilt through the rocks and build my soil, and even having the same experiences there. And then, and then the people that don't even have the privilege of having um, uh, soil in their backyard. They live in an urban environment where there's nothing but concrete in the balcony, or they're too busy, or the homeowners association doesn't allow a, a garden in the soil. So there's a lot of reasons people can't use a conventional garden. And so uh, this is where Epcot really inspired me. And Epcot is actually a, uh, opened in 1982, and it was a four-acre uh, living research uh, hydroponic and aquaculture laboratory growing um, up to 100 food crops from around the world 365 days out of the year. So just an amazing display of, of uh, growing technology and agricultural techniques. And every day, thousands and thousands of guests came through on a boat ride, like you see right here, and had the opportunity to learn about what we were doing and, and, and bring these ideas around the world. In fact, I would say it was probably the land that helped inspire many of the small hydroponic farms for the last 30 years um, all over the United States. One of the unique things as well, um, when you look at all these people coming through on the boat ride, it prevented us from really ever spraying harmful chemicals. So back in the early uh, uh, 80s, Disney had to learn how to, to develop organic style pest control. And we developed our own beneficial insects, our own breeding programs, our best management practices, and all this is a very important part of growing uh, what I like to call beyond organic food, food that is, is highly nutritious, it's uh, safe for people to eat, and, um, and free of harmful chemicals and pathogens. There's an example of a 70-pound of a gourd, just one of the unique crops that uh, we grew from around the world. Probably one of my most favorite greenhouses at the land of Epcot was the aeroponic greenhouse. Um, uh, I love aeroponics because aeroponics is considered to be the best of all hydroponics. It's cutting edge. It's used by NASA, used by leading, uh, leading research institutions around the world. And that squash plant there grows so fast aeroponically because it's being spoon fed maximum amounts of oxygen. It's 12 feet tall from the bottom of the root to the top of the plant about six weeks old, and you can see the massive amount of squash that's already been harvested off of that beautiful plant. Part of my uh, job at Disney and, and, and during my stay at Disney was to travel around the U.S. and other parts of the world, share what we were doing, and bring that technology back. And, 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 and that experience gave me a very unique perspective on the last 50 years of hydroponics and, and how mainstream it had become around the world, and yet the challenges um, that still plagued it, which we'll talk about later. And just to give you an example, this is Glass City in Holland, uh, the largest concentration of high-tech greenhouses in the world. They focus on growing tomato, cucumber, bell pepper. This is a plastic city outside of Almera, Spain. And uh, this is the largest concentration of plastic greenhouses in the world. And you can literally see these from satellites. And again, as Mitra just pointed out in Diplomier's presentation, there we have a, a dry land that normally was not fertile enough to go to grow anything. And their food would have had to be shipped from miles and miles away. And here these beautiful greenhouses are able to grow uh, food just a few miles from farm to table uh, near this city. Here we are in uh, Queensland, Australia, growing right outside in the, in the uh, beautiful arid climate there. 
and even all the way to Indonesia. They've been growing hydroponically for years as well. And instead of metal and glass, they, they use the polycarbonate and bamboo. Now, as we start looking at the natural resources used for agriculture, uh, the one drawback of greenhouses is that the structures can be expensive and they require considerable natural uh, resources uh, uh, to build and, 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 and you know, obtain the raw materials for them. So it's always been my vision uh, from the early years at Disney and the future growing, growing up instead of out as our solution. We can reduce capital costs for the structure, natural resources, and most importantly, we're reducing the heating and cooling as part of our month-to-month uh, -month, uh, operation because we're working in a much smaller space. In this greenhouse, you can see this you know, huge greenhouse roof, all this space. We've got about a six-inch horizontal crop of basil. And so what if we could take that crop you see right there and kaboom, we're growing up. And, and, and that's the vision. And, and that's really the birth of the Tower Garden and what we're doing here at Juice Plus. But it just didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen by magic. It took a lot of years of work. And so the question is, how did we evolve into the Tower Garden technology that you see today? And I think this is important for the Juice Plus team to understand because there's a lot of gimmicks out there in the hydroponic world and there's a lot of hydroponic stores and people might ask questions, well, why wouldn't I use this? Or why wouldn't I use that system? Or why wouldn't I use that guano or as a fertilizer? So in the next five minutes, I'm going to share with you why we're so much different than everything else out there and uh, why what we have is really the best. Again, going back to my years at Disney, I knew that growing up and out was a solution. And I had the fortunate opportunity to work with one innovative company that was, uh, there was only one company out there back in the mid-90s that was even attempting to grow Oracle, which was exciting to me, and I became good friends with them, and I brought their technology into Disney. And uh, these were styrofoam stacking technologies, and, and um, so the concept is great. The challenge I ran into over the years was seeing that, that you know, uh, styrofoam isn't very green, it breaks down, uh, so the life is very short. And then, and then within these pots, we had a growing medium, like a perlite or rock wool, uh, excuse me, perlite or coconut fiber. And then you'll see at the top of each tower there was a little dripper. So we, so the plants at the top got more food than the plants at the bottom. And then that nutrient solution, whatever dripped out of the bottom was wasted. So we went through a lot of pots and, and, and every time we grow a crop, we got to uh, throw away uh, the growing media that we used. So that really inspired me using that vertical growing system to say, this is great, but you know what? We can do so much better. We can use a plastic that's sustainable, that lasts a long, long time. Um, it's hydroponics. We don't need a growing medium, so, so why use one at all? Why, why spend that money on another natural resource when we don't need it? And we definitely need to be a recirculated system for the points I'll talk about at the moment. So that was the beginning of my inspiration. And so in 2005, when Dustin and I launched Future Growing uh, with our team, we asked one a key powerful question. What do we need to do to improve this technology to help it become mainstream? For two sectors of the market. One was the commercial sector. The other was the homeowner sector, which I've been working in for many years. The, the homeowner sector, which is or the residential or really what the Juice Plus side of the business is all about, is probably one of my uh, a, a leading passion that, um, you know, way back then because I'd always been involved in the health and wellness community. I've been taking Juice Plus since 1995. And I've been teaching people how to grow to help them become more healthy and, and the benefits of eating produce, local produce, right out of their own backyard. However, the systems that I had to set up for them were challenging and cumbersome and required Tim Blank to come over once a week and and after I started helping all these people for free, I, I became very busy. So uh, the homeowner tower garden might have been developed for itself, a little bit of a selfish reason, too, if I am to be a little bit comical about this. But there's a little bit of truth to that. But I knew that in, in order for this to become mainstream, we had to develop something that was plug and play, with simple instructions, one size fits all nutrient solution that, that, that can be easy for anyone to use from it 
from a, a, a child in elementary school to an old person in a wheelchair. So let's walk through some of those key benefits that I just talked about over the existing technology. And, and I'm not, uh, and I want to be uh, point out when I when I make that phrase that I'm not trying to to point a benefit over competition like an infomercial. I'm just sharing with you simple raw facts of here's what exists and and here's what we did about it. And, and again, that that world that first idea of what was going on in the world really helped us address these challenges in, instantly. So the first challenge was hydroponic fertilizers. Uh, back in uh, 2005 or today, you can walk into a hydroponic store. And if you don't know anything about hydroponics and you want to grow food in your backyard, you're just going to be completely overwhelmed. And you're going to talk to a guy that you know his primary focus is probably using hydroponics for something else other than growing food. And if you look at all the shelves, uh, you'll see dozens and dozens of bottles, of, and you've got a, you've got, you know, I almost have a chemistry degree to pick the combination of liquids. You've got your starter juice, you've got your flowering juice, you've got your middle growth juice, you've got your your final stage juice. You've got this has to be for tomatoes. Even in the commercial industry, we had a pepper formula, we had a tomato formula, and uh, then you've got to buy all this expensive equipment. Uh, to, to test the chemistry in the in the in the balance, and uh, and for me, I just knew that that was ridiculous. So that that was the way hydroponics was going to be. It was the average consumer. So I took my science background that I gained when I worked for NASA, the Department of Energy and Land, and 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 uh, put my mind to good use and created the amazing tower tonic. It took several years. But the tower tonic is a one size fits all uh, hydroponic and aeroponic uh, mineral solution. So our focus was to move away from petrochemicals, monocle nitrogen. Amitra and I were talking, I'll pause for a moment and, and talk about a very important point to, to Mitra's heart and, and that's that the monocle nitrogen it's commonly used in modern agriculture, even in organic agriculture. It's not anhydrous ammonia in organic agriculture, but it comes from urea and chicken manure and cow manures and things like that. And the interesting thing about monocle nitrogen is that that uh, it's like uh, uh, table sugar to people. When a complex plant or a food crop is exposed to um, monocle nitrogen in its environment, it just sucks it up like a sponge, quick growth, and you have reduced cell structure, you have more susceptibility to, to uh, insect infestation. So that was one of our key targets, to get a monocle nitrogen out of the nutrient solution, um, use pure, safe earth minerals, lots of calcium, lots of magnesium, trace minerals that are not only important to plants, but that are also important to people. In fact, as far as I know, back in 2005, I was the first company in the world to even focus on human nutrition for hydroponic food production. So although we are aeroponics, which is a form of hydroponics, we're much more advanced than what you're going to find with the leading products uh, in the marketplace today. And this increased uh, uh, mineral content into our nutrient solution is giving us more nutrient dense food. We're already doing, we've already begun our pilot research with Juice Plus. Results are, we've seen thus far are amazing. And I know that Juice Plus will be publishing those results in the months and the years uh, to come. So, so stay tuned to that. And as the other thing I want to focus on, or, or excuse me, mention about that mineral solution is also almost twice as strong as any bottle that you'll find in a hydroponic store. So when we did that nutrient solution, our goal wasn't to really even make a profit off of it. Our goal was just to do the best job we could do and then and let people grow successfully with it. So in a lot of modern uh, marketing and systems, in that you can buy a printer or cost and then you pay a fortune for the ink and that's kind of what the hydroponic business is, and 
we kind of look at it from the other direction and, and, and to do it right and to make it safe and food healthy. So the interesting thing about that nutrient solution is it really makes us beyond organics. You know, even with certified organic food production, there are no standards for uh, the output of the plant, it's only the input. So that was very important to us that we don't, we're not waiting for government regulation. We went beyond what the government is mandating and just did what we could do best. Now the next goal there, modern hydroponics requires a different system for different crops. So first we solved the, the tower tonic thing with getting a one size fits all. Now we had to do that for the growing system. And the tower garden can grow almost any above ground crop other than trees, woody vines, and shrubs. Crops range in size from a head of lettuce to a large watermelon. If you look at the previous hydroponic systems there, you had to use a bag system to grow peppers. You use a channel system to grow lettuce. And these channel systems are really interesting. <clears throat> Most of them are not made out of food grade plastic. They, uh, uh, the plant can only stay in there a short period of time. If it gets too tall, the wind hits it, it blows over, the water comes out and your plants die. If the plants stay in there too long, the roots fill up the channel and uh, prevent uh, the water from flowing to the end. The water drains, uh, eventually drains the whole tank and your plants wither and die. So channel systems have been plagued with problems for years. And so we wanted to create a system that had enough space for lots and lots of roots. We've grown, as future grown, we've grown plants in the tower garden now for up to two and a half years without any leaking or roots completely clogging up the system. So that is just so exciting to us that we were able to solve that issue. And here we have another system with a 50-foot piece of steel holding up eggs to grow cucumbers. So all, all that stuff is kind of nonsensical to us. Here we have a styrofoam, you know, more styrofoam, almost 50% of hydroponic systems use some form of cheap plastic like uh, styrofoam, which degrades quickly, especially under UV. And um, so, again, there we are, the tower garden, the one size fits all growing system. And, and for those of you that haven't seen the tower yet, you're wondering how could that be? We'll take a look. Here we have some beautiful cucumbers. There are some beautiful heirloom tomatoes. And what we do in this case is, is uh, every eight inches we have four planting parts. So for large vine crops like a, a tomato, a cucumber, things like that, we will actually plant four plants at the top of the tower on these large commercial systems. A third of the way down, we plant four more plants. And a third of the way down, we plant four more plants. We uh, don't plant every hole when we're using very large plants like you see right here. And again, we can get beautiful crops out of the system that way without growing media, without a bag, without a tray, without all the other stuff. Just uh, That's my hand in that picture. There's some beautiful heirloom tomatoes. And uh, there's all different ways we can do these crops. There you see some, some uh, beautiful green leaf lettuce with uh, uh, four and a half week old uh, summer squash down below. There's okra. Now crops, uh, large crops like okra or tomatilla, things that become a bush, when you buy a tower or you can get what they call a plant cage or a tomato cage, which is three rings that stack up like a little support cage. Now they're not made to lean on, they're just made to support plant material like you see right there. In this particular case, we'll plant four okra at the bottom, four okra in the middle, and those eight plants will turn into a huge bush that's about six feet wide by about six feet tall and produce hundreds of okra over the crop cycle. There's some beautiful heirloom purple tomatilla, molding fennel. Again, another example of a large uh, watermelon at the top, uh, excuse me, at the bottom and chives up at the top. Cantaloupe using the plant cage, peppers, tomatoes, heirloom tomato, beautiful strawberries, and everybody's favorite is strawberries. So you get the point. The one size fits all really holds true. No, no giant pieces of steel, no giant floating ponds, uh, no bending over and digging down into the soil. You can walk right up to your tower and see every plant and grow almost every crop that I just mentioned. Next, I'd like to address the plastic. I've already been talking about this. There are um, plenty of toxic growing materials. The government really doesn't regulate agriculture yet in, in these areas. 
So, so we wanted to get ahead of that curve. But being part of the science community and health and wellness community all the way back uh, from the early 90s, I became very aware of these problems before they were even being talked about in the mainstream health and wellness uh, community. Uh, so many of the grown systems are made with non-food grade plastic. Polystyrene is very popular, yet totally unwelcome. Lifespan of these products are short, so you know they're they're less green and less sustainable because they don't hang around too long. Um, now I do want to point out, you know, I've had people ask me, can you make? Why did you make the tower garden out of a more green product like clay or? concrete or, or ceramic. And the tower garden, the answer to that question is very simple. The tower garden, like a, a, a juicer, which many of us on the call today use, is a high-tech precision product. Therefore, it has to be made up of quality plastic. So we chose to make our plastic out of very strong, UV-stabilized, food-grade plastic. And the beautiful part of it all, the majority of the tower garden components, are manufactured right here in the United States of America. So we know what goes into our products. And, and these things were a mission of ours from the day we started in this. And, and, and all the key manufacturers and people we talked to all tried to push us towards China, cheap plastic, reduce the thickness, and, and we just went totally in the other direction. The other key thing I want to mention, too, is that that plastic material is completely opaque. It does not allow the sunlight into the tower. Therefore, it prevents algae from growing inside the tower. Also, because it's opaque, the sun can't break the plastic down from the inside out. So not only have we UV stabilized it for years and years and years of outdoor use, we've also protected the inner side. Most plastics break down from the inside out because when the sun hits them, the sun is actually passing through the plastic itself. You know, if you go to buy a, a, a gardening pot from Home Depot, if I've seen this once, I've seen it a thousand times all over the world. People go to the local garden center, they buy this expensive $20, $30, $40, $50 dollar pot, then they buy another $20, $30 dollar bag of soil, and they buy the miracle Grow, and then they buy a bunch of bottles of chemicals, and they buy several, you know, uh, vegetable transplants. So, you know, they're already well into half the price of a tower garden by there, and a year later, that the, the no more nutrients in the soil, laced with chemicals from all their sprays, and the pot they're growing in, that beautiful pot, is discolored and brittle and beginning to crack. Now, when, it, when a plastic pot is brittle, that means the look of plasticizer that it was made with have been leaching out into the environment where the vegetable roots are. So, so there's, you know, when I see people growing food in old plastic buckets and soda bottles and things like that, it's just it's incredibly disappointing, not the fact that they're trying to grow food, the fact that they don't probably realize they're growing in plastic that's leaching chemicals right into their food. Now the next uh, subject here, many conventional hydroponic growing systems require a support medium for the roots, such as rock wool, perlite, cocoa fiber, and peat light mixes. So the drawbacks, again, of those are additional costs, additional carbon footprint, cleanup disposal, and again, we do not use a growing medium in our tower garden. So there you see it's just an empty growing pot that can be used year after year. It's dishwasher safe. You can actually take this pot and, and throw it 20 feet off of the top of a roof pot, uh, a rooftop, excuse me. It'll hit the concrete and bounce without cracking or breaking. It'll probably do more it'll probably do more damage to the concrete than it will to the pot. So it's just a very, very robust uh, material. And uh, when juice plus six of a ton on the manufacturing side, they not only maintained our quality standards we have at Future Growing, they also improved upon them. And there we have that beautiful aeroponic uh, chai plant, uh, just about, uh, I believe that one was 8 to 12 weeks old, with dozens of harvests off that one plant already. So uh, traditional hydroponic systems generally require large support structures like steel benches, hanging gutters. You saw some of those pictures. In many cases, these technologies simply cannot be installed on a rooftop or an urban setting. Um, they, they require a crane and be very expensive. And then as soon as you install them, they're considered a permanent fixed structure. They penetrate a roof membrane. Uh, they penetrate a, a wall. You have to get a permit. Uh, and they can be incredibly costly to install. 
So the beautiful thing about the tower burn is we wanted something modular, a high-tech space base that can be installed almost anywhere in the world in a matter of minutes. It only 30 uh, and only requires a 30-inch diameter footprint at the base, and that's just amazing, absolutely amazing when you think about what you're comparing to in the world of hydroponics and what you can grow in 30 inches. And, and, and this modular technology can be stacked. It shows that the residential unit shows up at your doorstep five pots tall. So take a look at this. That 30-inch footprint, we can start out with 20 plants, grow seven pots, nine pots, 11 pots, 44 plants, 11 pots tall, and a 30-inch footprint. Absolutely amazing. I took this picture before I, I left Orlando for the Phoenix Conference, and there I harvested just half that tower. 20 had a beautiful bed lettuce, 24 weeks old right there in Apopka, Florida, off of one tower with a 30-inch footprint. That's what the dream was from day one. Massive amount of food, highly nutritious, pesticide-free, in a very, very short amount of time, in a very, very small space, from field to table in a matter of feet. Okay, benefits of the, another key benefit, uh, many vertical growing systems are not drained to waste. Uh, the plants are irrigated and then uh, the solution isn't recaptured and so hydroponics does have a little bit of a reputation of polluting water sources in some areas and uh, the tower garden is a closed system. It recycles 100% of the water, so it uses a little 10% of the water and far less nutrients as compared with organic and conventional field farming. And this is how it works. You hear your tower burn. You've got your uh, nutrient solution reservoir down below. Your pump is your low wattage pump. It uses extremely little energy, the same amount of energy you use to run a little uh, bird bath or fountain in your backyard. But this even uses less because it's on a timer. It doesn't have to run continuously. So when the timer activates the pump, it turns on, draws nutrient solution out of the center into the shower cap, past the roots, and recaptures it right down into the reservoir. So there's so many hydroponic systems in the world today, and why aeroponics and not another type of hydroponics? So as I mentioned in the beginning, aeroponic systems that are to be the best, even used by NASA, cutting-edge research institutions around the, around the world, University of Arizona, University of Florida. Modern research has shown that increased oxygen to the root system helps prevent disease and improve plant growth. It should sound familiar because that's the same with human beings. One of the key challenges with all the aeroponic systems on the market today has been that the, the, uh, historically the misters clog and they continually need to be cleaned and maintained. So you end up with a lot of wilted dead plants. And so uh, the Panda technology that was used by the Tower Garden eliminates the use of misters and clogging. It has literally revolutionized aeroponic growing. So that was one of the final keys and our design work with the tower garden. You can see some beautiful aeroponic roots. So next I'd like to talk about, you know, why, you know, beyond health reasons. I think a lot of us involved in the health and wellness community and Juice Plus were focused on the tower garden just simply so we can have fresh, nutritious, healthy, chemical-free food right in your own backyard. But there's other reasons, and, and, and they mesh with Dr. DePomier's uh, uh, a point about what was going on in the world. In many parts of the world, we just have a limited availability of water. Many parts of the U.S. Uh, and other around the world, the water is contaminated in some states. Yet people still have to use it because it's their only source. Um, limited availability of natural resources for modern agriculture. We've got to reduce this huge carbon footprint on modern agriculture. Uh, providing safe and healthy food for the world's population. I mean, that's all. I mean, what do we hear on the news all the time? Topsoil is, you know, becoming more and more depleted. The nutrient, the the, the, uh, the food is less nutrient dense. Um, harmful rodents and things running through the farm fields. E. coli, um, uh, salmonella getting into our food system. So when I say safe, I mean we want to uh, we're free of harmful pathogens and chemicals. And when we're healthy, we want to have slow-releasing plant proteins and complex carbohydrates, phytonutrients, and abundant trace minerals. 
And again, there are no national standards in the United States, including the organic national standards, that have anything to do with what I just talked about here. Their only regulations are for what the input to the plant, uh, the plant is. So really with, the, with what we're doing in the future room in the tower garden is really focusing beyond organic, getting the plant up off the ground, away from harmful critters that would, that would uh, typically put pathogens into our crop. Now, if we're growing it in, out in your garden where you're growing potatoes and radishes and tubers and things in the soil, I can always take those things and scrub them off and wash them, but we can't do that with the leaf leafy greens and lettuces and herbs and so the tower garden is a great way just to keep those plants safe and free and up off the ground from a, 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 a plant a, a human pathogen standpoint. <clears throat> so the solutions that we see for these challenges that, and, and that, that really pertain to what the tower garden is all about is growing up instead of out to deal with the land space. Uh, grow local. I mean, this technology allows us to grow local anywhere. And you'll see some of these stories in just a moment that you don't have to use harmful chemicals. We can collect rainwater instead of pulling water out of the ground or out of the Great Lakes. Um, uh, you can teach your friends and family how to grow their own food. It helps create community, love, spirit back in our local urban environments. Uh, use quality fertilizer and minerals for your growing area. So whether you're using a tower garden or backyard garden, you're in control you can determine what's going to go into your food. And uh, the most important thing I can see as a solution is as you learn to garden better, and you learn about uh, natural techniques and tower garden technology, share the best practices with the, west of your, with the rest of your green family in the Juice Plus community. Now let's take a look at what we're doing in future growing uh, to, to meet these challenges. Uh, we see rooftop food production as being, you know, one of the key solutions to food production in the future. Uh, we have these huge urban environments all over the world. We're shipping in food over thousands and thousands of miles in many cases. Where I'm from in Orlando, Florida, most of my lettuce and herbs come from California, if not another country. So, so uh, that's just a massive carbon footprint. And so, uh, growing food in a local environment. I'd like to show you this, this building here. This is the world's first certified green building with commercial scale aquaponic and aeroponics on the rooftop. This was a project of ours. We started back in uh, 2007, opened late 2008. It's in a historic uh, downtown district in uh, Metro Orlando. Uh, there's some of the beautiful towers, 60 plants per tower you see right there. Uh, we also did aquaponics where we grew fish. We developed a proprietary system that digested the fish waste into minerals. And those minerals were turned around and used to feed the plants in the greenhouse on the rooftop. Now, fish and plant systems are very complicated. They generally take a very uh, well-skilled biologist on staff to, to uh, maintain those. So, uh, you know, we don't recommend those for every homeowner. They, they, they tend to be more failures more often than not but they do work great right in environments where you have you know, skilled people around. That's how we started little seedlings up there on the rooftop and those little benches just uh, flood and drain the plants from below and they're ready for transplants within uh, as little as a week and a half to two weeks. There's a tomato seedling uh, uh, on your left, three days old on your right, a couple weeks, how well rooted in, there's the tower garden running, uh, watering the plant roots. See all the beautiful crops and one of the unique things in an urban setting, labor can be expensive, so we also taught our local chefs how to come over and harvest their own food. They would wash their hands at the sink up to their elbows and, and uh, make sure their clothing was fresh and clean so they wouldn't bring in any foreign uh, uh, insects into our greenhouse operation. And the chefs loved it, and they would weigh and mark down their produce that they used uh, when they left. And that way they could get the premium produce uh, for their tables. We have two restaurants right there coming up uh, several times a week getting these beautiful fresh lettuces and herbs. And I, the, the interesting thing is <laughs> this produce is so nutritious that the aromatic, the aromatic compounds, the essential oils are potent. The, you know, these chefs would walk in, back into the, the, the front door the, through the restaurant into the kitchen. The whole entire restaurant was filled with aromatic compounds of of cilantro and purple basil and tomato that you see right there. It's just incredible. 
And here we have uh, uh, the uh, Bell Book and Candle. This is a project uh, we built out in uh, two, uh, 2010. Uh, this was the Manhattan's first roof to table aeroponic farm. Uh, uh, it is uh, a 60 cow garden farm feeding an 80 seat restaurant. Uh, here we see again a, a typical black rooftop heating up the uh, uh, tenants below. And within 40 hours, we converted that space to a uh, cow garden farm. Underneath the towers is, is a, a white woven UV stabilized plastic material. And what that does is that takes the heat load off the building and reflects the light back up to the plants. It also reflects the heat away from the building. So I can tell you the sixth floor tenants were very grateful when we put this farm in because their energy costs went down. Now, after we installed this farm, we transplanted the little seedlings that were most of them were, were about two weeks old. Some of the herbs were four weeks. And this next slide is about four and a half weeks later when CNN and ABC Days Dateline came over to tour the roof spot. And you know, wow, look at that. All those plants, just what they did in four and a half weeks is absolutely amazing. Beautiful tomatoes are not quite green yet, but they're growing. And this was uh, April into May in Manhattan. Beautiful melons. There's the okra plant that I showed you earlier uh, right up front. Uh, eight okra, four in the bottom, four in the middle. And you have that beautiful okra bush. Right to the left of that is a tomatilla bush. The amazing thing was, too, in Manhattan, that when we put all these plants in, we thought we would need to get some bumblebees to pollinate some of the, the uh, unique fruits that needed to, that, uh, you need, that need pollination. And, and we probably identified over 12 different species of bees that flew in and were just hovering all over these plants. And that was just an amazing little ecosystem going on in the heart of a metropolis. And if you want to go visit this restaurant, uh, you can talk to Nicholas Sullivan or John Mooney at the Bell Book and Candle. This is uh, 101 West 10th Street and West Village in Manhattan. There's Chef John Mooney and there's some of his tomatilla. This spring will be year three at the Bell Book and Candle. Now, the, the, uh, the city of New York has also had some green mandates now, and uh, they, the city actually uh, put, installed one of our farms on the Parks and Rec building in Randall's Island, and all this produce is harvested and used to feed the you know, local uh, uh, food bank uh, nearby that feeds the homeless. So it has a real great story. Story. Rick, Rick Gordon there is a been a lifetime gardener in New York, and uh, they always have this green roof, and he was just so excited to get the technology in and, and get it producing the abundance of food. Um, for that shelter. You can see some of his green roof ornamental plants there in the background. So that's just a few of our rooftops and uh, some of the rooftops uh, that will be coming in uh, uh, 2012. Uh, Playa, uh, it's an urban land cuisine in West Hollywood. Uh, they just uh, launched their firm a couple weeks ago. Salvation Army Chicago. Uh, Rouse's Supermarket, New Orleans, Louisiana. They just had a press release Monday is the first supermarket in the U.S. with an aeroponic farm or hydroponic farm on the rooftop. Capella Gardens in Santa Barbara, and, and uh, this is a brand new garden started by a uh, national uh, marketing director of Juice Plus, uh, Sandy Campbell and Joy Kelly. And they have a beautiful historic home in, uh, in uh, uh, Santa Barbara, just a block off the beach. And uh, their whole life has been about health and wellness and physical fitness and training. And uh, now they are taking their lifestyle to the next step and uh, creating an outdoor living space with an outdoor kitchen, outdoor sitting, a place to have community, a place to share with their friends, and a place to grow 30 towers and produce uh, uh, well over 1,000 plants for their own use, for their local food bank, and for their local livelihood that their daughter is going to be involved with them in. Beautiful story. Now let's move from the rooftop down to the ground. Uh, here we have our urban farm. And uh, this is a beautiful operation. It's called the Greenhouse, and, uh, and it's a part of Metro Orlando. It's operated by two sisters, uh, Jessica and Catherine. And they do this part-time. They both come kind of from the corporate world. And uh, their passion was to get back to nature and to help people. And so they just do a fantastic job. This greenhouse has, 
uh, 72 towers and a double row configuration, 11 pots tall. So each tower has 44 plants. And earlier this year, in October, between October and November, we did a, a uh, we asked them if we could come in and do a time lapse study. And I want to show you these uh, basil plants. You see uh, purple basil on your right, green basil on your left, purple pak choy in the further left. This time lapse was taken over a 24-day period. And I want you to see how quickly this farm can grow in a controlled environment agriculture in Florida during our short day season, which is uh, our, excuse me, our yeah, short day, short life period even. There we go. 24-old day days on purple basil on your right, green days on your left. And I can just smell that basil looking at that picture because I was there. Uh, when those pictures were taken. Here we have another part of the greenhouse where they were growing lettuce. You have fed lettuce on your right, beautiful uh, uh, gourmet lettuce mix on your left. And as you look at that left grow out, you will see that's called salad bowl planting where we plant six different varieties of lettuce all in one tower. And then when we harvest it, we just cut that head of lettuce three times and you have an entire salad bowl uh, coming from one head, like you see on your left there. There's a beautiful bit of lettuce on the right. You don't have to really do any washing, any cleaning, just three cuts and boom, you have your salad ready for dinner. And uh, when they harvest their produce, they will do it in two ways. One way, they'll take a, a, a great kitchen tub, they'll fill it with a, uh, a half a bucket of water, and this is one of the key, uh, excuse me, half an inch of water, excuse me, and one of the key advantages of aeroponic growing is they can take the plants out with the roots, put them in that tray, and then just deliver them directly to the restaurant, and the restaurant will give them the tray back. Now, for other vendors who want to sell at a farmer's market or something like that, they will take the plant, and they'll put it inside the cornstarch biodegradable bag, put a tablespoon of water at the bottom, wrap a rubber band around the roots, and have a living plant. And the cool thing about this greenhouse is there is no refrigeration. So we're taking another component out of that, that carbon footprint. The energy and the materials that go into conventional refrigeration are no longer necessarily needed with this type of technology. In fact, people buy these plants at the local farmer's market and they go set it on their kitchen counter because they want to smell the, they want to, to, smell, the, to smell the kitchen up with beautiful uh, 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 basil and herbs and things like that that they picked up at their farmer's market. So a very unique way of doing it and a key advantage with aeroponics and the power tonic nutrient solution that you just simply don't get with other hydroponic growing systems. Now, this is an Amish greenhouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and they're totally off-grid, rainwater collection, geothermal, uh, energy generation, and they produce beautiful crops for the uh, local community. And many of these uh, Base, and they will literally flush back in one to two weeks. So for those of you that are juicers out there, it's wonderful. My wife and I are, and we walk out to our tower gardens every morning. We break off kale leaves and chard leaves and parsley, and uh, we either cut them back like you see right there, or we break off the oldest leaves, and they just literally just flush out so quickly. And once that root system is established in an aeroponic chamber, they're just feeding like there's no tomorrow. So, so you will see the growth in your tower garden becomes exponential as the plant ages. Unlike your, unlike your garden, kind of like the plants burn out and wear out. The soil bakes, it gets hot, the root system gets tired of pushing its way through all the sand and boulders and pebbles and things like that. So it, it's quite the opposite of what you typically experience in a garden. And again, at our, our local farms, they create these beautiful displays and uh, to really show people how fresh and wonderful uh, their produce is. Another, this greenhouse is a beautiful operation uh, just uh, uh, near my home in central Florida. This is in Eustis, Florida. This uh, greenhouse is called the Living Towers Farm. It's owned by Dr. Dan Young, who is the National Marketing Director for Juice Plus. And again, here we use alternative energy to generate power for the greenhouse. And uh, Jan's focus is to grow food for uh, uh, her local uh, uh, produce buying club. 
think there's, if I remember correctly, there's seven or 80 families involved. And uh, Jan could not get fresh lettuce during the summer months in Florida. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why she built this commercial greenhouse was to maintain a pallet of produce for these families year-round. And uh, in Florida, we get a lot more uh, uh, insects and diseases than uh, other folks do in many parts of the country. So if you're, you're releasing some beneficial mites that eat harmful mites and thrips uh, in the greenhouse, <laughs> here you see some other lettuces and nasturtium flower. And here we have a picture of Jay Martin um, back in uh, 2010 taking his first tour of Jan's greenhouse and just, just completely astonished at what he saw. And it, you know, in my opinion, it took Jay about two seconds to determine that this would be such an incredible match uh, for the Juice Plus family. And uh, I'll explain that a little bit further down the road here. The other thing that Jan focuses on at, at her facility is, of course, the selling tower. So the other half of her facility is a tower garden farm where she grows, you know, wonderful strawberries in the Florida in the wintertime and has the typical standard homeowner-based tower garden and teaches people how to grow and control pests, how to, how to uh, uh, make your own fresh, healthy salads. In fact, one of the best ways to introduce the tower garden to your friends and neighbors and to get people involved in Juice Plus is to simply make them a salad from your tower garden and that's pretty much all you know all you have to do and the rest is history as that tasty food slides down into their stomach. And a, a, another beautiful setup we have here, here's a restaurant and and used just called the One Horse Cafe. And uh, Al Chioli is the owner and he actually puts tower gardens, he said, and we put the tower gardens right around the table. And I kind of you know, question that of course, because most of our restaurant facilities had, had tower gardens uh, uh, further away, and um, but it had the opposite effect of what I thought. People actually came back more frequently to eat, to look and see how their plants are growing. They grew so fast. People were amazed. Uh, they would talk to their plants. They would protect their plants. They'd introduce other guests to their plants. And so if they sat at that table, they thought they owned that plant. So it's, it was just an interesting green experience that happened um, in these settings. And so it's so easy for a Juice Plus distributor to work with local organic vegan restaurants who, who are interested in locally grown produce and sustainable grown produce and to even just start out with three, four, five, six towers. They don't have to become a commercial grower instantly, get them introduced to the technology and then you have a place where you can now bring your, your other friends that you want to bring on board. Absolutely, there's a tower garden that's just four weeks old with spicy gourmet lettuce at the bottom. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, the last operation I want to show you here, um, but not the least by any means, is Chicago O'Hare. And this was in 2011. This was the world's first aeroponic farm in an airport terminal. Um, and all this produce is used to feed many of the 67 restaurants that are at the Chicago Air airports. And here are some of the fine restaurants that this urban tower garden farm that where that produce goes. There's um, about 20 different food crops there, uh, famous restaurants like Woking Puck. And what a neat environment. Airports are always mechanical, and, and what and what a great way to teach people about uh, local food. And uh, there's uh, some of our Juice Plus family uh, with the airport commissioner uh, during the grand opening. And uh, they serve food around the farm. And if, 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 you, if anyone ever wants to go see a great tower garden farm in action, I often say the cheapest farm to go see is the one at Chicago O'Hare because it's open 365 days out of the year. You get a one-way plane ticket. You don't have to go through security twice. You don't have to get a rental car or a hotel room. All you need is about two to four hours in the airport. And you can review view the farm, eat a nice, eat in a wonderful restaurant, and take your uh, trip back home. And here you can see them harvesting cilantro. And, and if you take a close look at the slide, you can see what I was talking about. That with that cilantro there, they cut it back to two to three inches, and literally in one week, that cilantro will be grown right back out. Now we do have grow life at this farm at O'Hare, and you know some people might be bothered because that may or may not be green, but, but what we have to do on our commercial farms is that we don't always have sunlight coming in through that window. We might have a lot of cloudy days. 
And so in order to produce consistent produce for the chefs and the restaurant, we also incorporate supplemental lighting when we need it so we can maintain a consistent growth uh, for our chefs there at the O'Hare Airport. So we have many, many uh, urban farms going into 2012, but some of the ones you can watch for would be in uh, Arizona, Alaska, Colorado, Florida, Missouri, Oklahoma, Holly Grove, New Orleans, which is now open, Texas, and the West Virginia Public School System, and many, many more. And the, the, the last note I kind of want to close our family here tonight with is this slide. And, and this really leads into the final conclusion of this presentation. And that is that really humanity is coming to a crossroad. And, and Mitra introduced that concept in the beginning. But uh, if you stop and just take a moment to ground in and, and feel the significance of what you've just seen and, and really where we're going into the future here. And if you see that little man there in that picture, he's, he's kind of headed towards the road where there's smog and pollution. And I, and I think there's still time to take a turn towards that left side of that road that's a little bit more brighter and cheerier. Because if you take a look at the, the road he's going down, it looks like this. And this truly is not the world that I anticipate Ava to grow up in or that you anticipate any of your children to grow up in. This is the world that I envision. That's that left side of that chart. I envision a green world. I'll tell you how we make it happen, guys. It all starts with one person, one family at a time. I'm not just telling you this stuff to go out and do it. I've been living this my whole life, from when I was seven years old, started my own garden, to developing into tower garden technology. Um, my family and I grow six tower gardens in our own backyard. And we not only grow enough produce for our own household, but we share it with our family members, we share it with our neighbors creates a sense of community, creates good conversation, and, uh, and uh, I'm a grower at heart, so we just grow a lot of produce in that backyard. And it's a lot of fun for us, and it's clean, it's up off the ground, and children really enjoy it. Uh, my daughter Ava, I think there, was just a little over one, literally would walk up to the towers and graze, and it was, a, it was the funniest thing you'd ever seen. And she just absolutely loves the, the tower garden, and, and children have a good intuition, and they know when they're eating healthy, safe food, and, and she would go berserk when she'd get near the towers there. And uh, we have since trained our daughter um, to stop grazing and to, to pull the food off and put it in a little bowl because we didn't like all that saliva on our lettuce at dinner time. So it's become a little bit better now. But, um, you know, it, it's scientifically proven that, that children who grow their own fruits and vegetables eat more fruits and vegetables. And there's an amazing connection that children have with the tower, tower and especially urban children who are used to mechanical things, you know, it's not, there's, you know, it's not down in the soil where there's spiders and bugs running around. It's, it's clean and it sounds wonderful. They hear the pump turn on, the water flowing. It's just an absolute beautiful, um, not only food production machine, but a beautiful piece of art right in the backyard. And, and there's Ava's first watermelon. Um, and there it is, just a few weeks later, uh, vine ripened and beautiful. And again, no chemical spread on any of that. And, and even in Florida, I don't even use organic chemicals. If I have too many bugs on a plant, I just uh, uh, take it out and throw it away and start one new. These plants grow so fast, I just usually beat out most of the insects. So I want to leave you with this evening. Is, uh, I'd like you all to be able to grow green, grow healthy, with the easiest garden on earth. and uh, uh, Let's all move forward and help create this green revolution for those that do want to be part of local, healthy, chemical-free food. Thank you.
Mitra, would you like me to uh, read these questions and then share them? Okay, I'm going to go ahead, and I'm not sure if I'm doing this correctly because this is a new little piece of technology for me. But I'm going to go ahead and read the questions coming through and uh, provide an, an answer. Are there any future plans for smaller model or uh, smaller family demo? And um, uh, the the uh, five. Uh, Tier Tower Garden is now available through Juice Plus Distributor, and uh, uh, more will be on the way in the future. 